A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IC Academy for the date 1st of March 2022. So these are the news articles I am going to discuss today. But before that we have a special session of previous year question discussion. And in this session I am going to discuss one previous year question today. But in the following days I will be discussing two or more questions. Now this news article is about uh, Turkey's decision to block access to Russian warships. We will see about the Montreux Convention in this discussion. And in this next discussion, we will be discussing about smooth coated otters. And in this next discussion, we will be discussing the editorial where we will be seeing about how Russia violates international laws by invading Ukraine. Now, in this next discussion, we are going to discuss about some of the important findings of this IPCC report. And following that, I have the practice prelims questions discussion and I also have a mains question for today. So, without wasting much time, let us get to the first session of previous year question discussion. So, the previous year question which I have taken today is based on prelims 2019. And as I said already, today I have only one previous year question. And in the coming days, I will be discussing two or three previous year questions. So, now let us take up the question. Now, this question is based on LT, that is long term evolution, and VOLT, voice over long term evolution. So, before looking into the question, let us see some basic facts about LTE and VOLT. First, let us see about LTE, that is long term evolution. See, it is a standard for high speed cellular data communication systems. Now, this LTE is associated with 4G and 5G wireless communication standards that are designed to provide higher speeds. Now, this speed is higher than the 3G networks for mobile devices. Actually, it provides download speed of about 100 Mbps and upload speed of about 50 Mbps. And note that this LTE may or may not support data and voice call services at the same time that is data services and voice call services at the same time. But even when it provides both, it doesn't mean that it will provide good quality voice call while using the data services. Plus also note that certain external applications are required to make video calls. For example, we need Skype or WhatsApp to make video calls in the LTE. Now I said that it does not provide good quality voice call while using the data services. Actually what it does it, it turns off data connection while making voice calls. Further, the call connection between two users is slower. It almost takes 7 seconds. So this is about LTE. Now on the other hand, we have the voice over LTE. This is a better standardized system to make high definition voice calls. Its voice call is made over 4G LTE network rather than the 2G or 3G connections which are usually used. So from the name itself, you would have understood that it allows users to make voice calling while using the data services. But note that this is done without changing the quality of the voice. But in the LTE, we saw that there is no good quality voice call in that. But here the voice quality is not changed. So. VOLT always supports data and voice call services at the same time and this means it does not turn off data connection while making voice calls. It also means that no external application is required to make video calls. Plus note that if both users are on uh, VOLT then the call connection is faster and that is why VOLT is more widely used nowadays. So these are some of the basic information that you need to know about LTE and VOLT. Now with these informations in mind, now let us look into the question. With reference to communications technologies, what is or are the difference or differences between LTE and VOLTE? First statement, LTE is commonly marketed as 3G and VOLTE is commonly marketed as advanced 3G. Statement 1 is incorrect because LTE is marketed as 4G LTE. This I did not mention before, but note that it is commonly marketed as 4G LTE and both LTE and VOLT are faster than 3G. We saw this already. So first statement is incorrect. Now the second statement states LTE is data only technology and VOLT is voice only technology. Now to some extent we can say that LTE is data only technology because we saw that it turns off data connection when uh, it makes voice calls. But 
Volti is not just voice only technology rather it supports both data and voice call services and that is why this statement is also incorrect now here in this question we have to find the differences between LTE and Volti and we have to find the correct differences and from the given statements we can say that both the differences are incorrect so the correct answer to this question is option D neither one nor so we are going to start our articles discussion with this news article. It talks about the restriction of access to the Russian warships that has been imposed by Turkey. See Russia's attack on Ukraine is recognized as a state of war by Turkey. So to deal with such scenarios, Turkey has implemented an international treaty which limits the passage of warships through two of its strategic straits. And the treaty we are talking about is the Montreal Agreement or the Montreal Convention. So in this context, let us see a few facts about the important straits and also about the Montreal Convention. See the straits which we are talking about is the Dardanelles Strait and the Bosphorus Strait. When we see strait, it means a narrow piece of sea that joins two larger seas. As you can see in this map, this is the Dardanelles Strait and this one is the Bosphorus Strait. And as you can see, the Bosphorus Strait connects the Black Sea with the Sea of Marmara. On the other hand, the Dardanelles Strait connects the Aegean Sea with the Sea of Marmara. So, both these straits connect to the Sea of Marmara. And note that both these straits have played a major role in world trade for centuries. Actually, about 48,000 vessels transit these straits each year. And this makes the area one of the world's busiest maritime gateways. And in case of Bosphorus Strait, you should note that it is also one of the world's most important choke points for the maritime transit of oil. Actually, over 3% of global supply of oil, mainly from Russia and the Caspian Sea, both pass through Bosphorus Strait. And this route also ships vast amounts of grains from Russia, Ukraine and Kazakhstan to the world markets. So in this way, Bosphorus Strait is very much important. And if we talk about the Black Sea to which the Bosphorus Strait connects to, we know that it is located between Europe and Asia. It has Russia to its northeast, Ukraine to the north, Georgia to the east, Turkey to the south and Bulgaria and Romania are in its west. And this Black Sea is the Russia's entrance to the world. It is also Russia's entrance to the Mediterranean and Atlantic spheres of influence. Now, in the current scenario, we know that Ukraine and Russia are in a major conflict. So, Ukraine has officially asked the NATO member Turkey to close the Dardanelles Strait. By closing this strait to Russia, it will stop the access to the Black Sea to the Russian ships. And this is done by applying the Montreux Convention. But here you should remember that Turkey has strong ties with both Russia and Ukraine. So, Turkey did not immediately respond to this request. And since Turkey has strong relations with both Russia and Ukraine, it actually even offered to host talks between both the country's leaders. But now it is expected that based on Ukraine's request, Turkey may block Russian warships. And as I already said, this is made possible through the implementation of Montreux Convention. So, let us see how this convention is applied here. First of all, note that this Montreux Convention was signed in 1936. It is an agreement concerning the Straits and Sea of Turkey that connects to the Black Sea. Yes, you are right. It deals with the Dardanelles Strait, the Sea of Marmara and also the Bosphorus Strait. Actually, this convention is a response to Turkey's request to refortify the area. And note that the signers of the Treaty of Lausanne and others, they met in Montreux in Switzerland and signed this treaty and they agreed to return this zone to the Turkish military control. So in this manner, the Montreux Convention is an essential element in the context of Black Sea security and stability. And this convention has been properly and impartially being implemented by Turkey for more than seven decades for now. Now let us see some of its important provisions. So firstly note that the merchant vessels enjoy freedom of passage through the Turkish Straits under this convention. But on the other hand, the war vessels, they are subject to some restrictions. See, this even varies depending on whether these vessels belong to the Black Sea riparian states or not. Here the Black Sea riparian states would mean the states which border Black Sea. 
So here the problem is, if in case the war vessels belong to the non-riparian states, then they are subject to specific restrictions. And these restrictions will be regarding maximum aggregate tonnage and duration of stay in the Black Sea. But there are also certain principal provisions in the convention which are regarding the passage of war vessels. And among them, the first important one states that aircraft carriers, whether belonging to riparian states or not, they can in no way pass through the Turkish Straits. And secondly, only submarines, those belong to the riparian states, can pass through the Turkish Straits, but they can pass through only for two purposes. First is for rejoining their base in the Black Sea. They will be rejoining their base when for the first time they have been bought or they are joining the base for the first time after construction. And the second purpose here would be for repairing in dockyards which are outside the Black Sea. Now for these two purposes, the submarines can pass through Turkish Straits. Now the next principal provision that is important in this convention is regarding the foreign naval forces. According to the convention, the total number of vessels allowed is 9 and the maximum aggregate tonnage allowed is 15,000 tons. And fourthly, the war vessels belonging to the non-riparian states cannot stay more than 21 days in the Black Sea. And apart from this, the convention also mentions that the passage through the Turkish Straits are to be notified to the Turkey. And they have to notify this through diplomatic channels prior to the intended passages. And in case of uh, war vessels belonging to the riparian states, they have to notify the Turkish government before 8 days. And in case of non-riparian states, they have to notify before 15 days. So this means Turkey will know what types of warships and warships belonging to which countries are passing through its straits. And by this, it will make sure that the safety of Black Sea is maintained and its country's security is also maintained. But here you may have a doubt of how can Turkey block warships belonging to Russia. Because so far we just saw that aircraft carriers cannot go through and submarines belonging to non-riparian states cannot go through the straits. But we know that Russia is a riparian state of Black Sea. Now in this scenario, the Article 20 of the Montreal Convention applies. And this provision deals with the situation in time of war. And as per this provision, as you can see here, the provisions we just saw, you know, regarding uh, the passage of merchant vessels, war vessels, etc., they will not apply. And in case of warships, the passage will be decided entirely by the Turkish government. So it is based on the discretion of the Turkish government. And based on this only, now Ukraine is asking Turkish government to block the passage of Russian warships through the Turkish Straits. So let us wait and see how Turkey decides because as I already said, Russia and Ukraine both are allies of Turkey. But on the other hand, if you see Turkey is a NATO member and Ukraine is planning to join NATO, whereas Russia is against NATO. So we can assume that Turkish government will make a decision based on all these factors and let us wait and see what happens in the following days. So these are the points that you need to know about uh, the important Turkish Straits and the Montreal Convention. See, we saw that Dardanelles Strait connects to Sea of Marmara and Aegean Sea and the Bosphorus Straits connects uh, Black Sea and Sea of Marmara. And we saw that these two straits are important in the world trade and they are busiest maritime gateways. Particularly since they provide passage to the Black Sea, they are much important for the Black Sea riparian states also. For example, Black Sea is Russia's entrance to the world. So, in this manner, these two straits play a major role in Russia's geopolitics. Then we saw about the Montreal Convention. We saw that it was signed in 1936 and it concerns the Dardanelles Strait, Bosphorus Strait and the Sea of Marmara. And one of its main aim is to ensure the security and stability of Black Sea. Then we saw some of the important provisions in the convention. We saw that merchant vessels enjoy freedom of passage. But in case of warships or war vessels, the conditions apply differently to the riparian states and non-riparian state. For example, aircraft carriers belonging to both riparian and non-riparian states are not allowed passage. And then submarines belonging to riparian states are only allowed and only for two purposes. That is when they rejoin their base and when they go for repair. And then we saw that war vessels belonging to non-riparian states cannot stay more than 21 days in the Black Sea. And plus, the passage through the Turkish states are to be notified to the Turkish government. 
and this notification has to be before 8 days for the riparian states and before 15 days for the non riparian states and finally we saw that based on article 20 turkey can actually block the passage of warships in time of a war so these are some of the important points that we need to remember in this discussion let us get to the next one now our next discussion is going to be based on this news article it mentions that smooth coated otters have been witnessed along the kaveri river stretch after a long time and since prelims is nearing i'm going to take this opportunity to discuss about the species smooth coated otters and we'll also see the threats faced by this species so first note that this species is also known as indian smooth coated otter it is distributed throughout south asia and southeast asia actually its presence has been confirmed in india pakistan nepal bhutan bangladesh southwest china myanmar thailand vietnam malaysia indonesia and brunei and particularly in india if you take it is distributed throughout our country from the himalayas in the north to the south and now if we see the characteristics of this species note that they have short but strong limbs and their fore paw and the hind paws are large and well webbed this helps the species to swim through waters and that is why this species is a strong swimmer and they also hunt in groups actually note that these otters are generally described as fish specialists and particularly this animal plays an important role in controlling the population of fish in rivers so you can understand that the species search for food in water and that is why smooth coated otters are found in areas where fresh water is plentiful they also prefer shallow and placid waters such as wetlands and seasonal swamps rivers lakes and rice paddies now coming to the major threats faced by the species the number one threat is loss of wetland habitats this happens due to construction of large scale hydroelectric projects and also when the wetland is converted for settlements and agriculture their habitat is also disturbed due to reduction in prey biomass then poaching is also a reason along with this contamination of waterway also leads to loss of habitat of this species the waterway here is contaminated mainly by the pesticides that are used in agriculture now with respect to poaching note that this species is poached believing that their pelt and other body parts possess therapeutic properties so pelt means skin and fur and sometimes even some nomadic tribes also hunt the species for meat now the reduction in prey biomass happens that is the reduction in fish stock happens due to overfishing by humans this is also a major threat and along with that infrastructural developments along the river stretches also led to the disappearance of otters from many streams and rivers which were once major otter habitats this includes the kaveri stretch also because here previously otters were predominantly present but now after a long time only they have been witnessed so from exam perspective we also need to know about the conservation status of the species now because of all these threats the species has been listed as vulnerable in the iucn red list and under sites also it has been listed in appendix 1 but note that in the wildlife protection act of 1972 that is the indian legislation it has been protected under schedule 2 part 2 so these are few points that you need to know about the species smooth coated otters what we saw we saw that they are distributed throughout south asia and southeast asia including india and in india they are present throughout our country from the himalayas to the south and they have a well webbed fore and hind paws which helps them in swimming and they are fish specialists and these species prefer fresh water and they are found in wetlands and seasonal swamps rivers etc and one of the major threats faced by the species is loss of wetland habitats and even poaching along with this reduction in prey biomass is also a major reason they are listed as vulnerable in iucn appendix 1 in sites and schedule 2 part 2 in wpa 1972 so with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion so our next discussion is going to be based on this editorial article it talks about russian invasion of ukraine see actually authors of this article argue that russia's actions in ukraine are brutal murder of the united nations charter and they are in violation of several other provisions of international laws also see as you know the russian president invoked the international laws in order to 
justify Russia's illegal actions in Ukraine but these justifications are incorrect according to the authors so in today's discussion we'll see what Russia has done in Ukraine and how these violates the international laws before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference so now let us start with the first violation done by Russia see first of all Russia has undertaken a full scale invasion of Ukraine we know that as you know the russian president in his decree has also recognized the independence and sovereignty of donetsk and lugansk as people's republic that is he has recognized the independence of these territories along with this he has also signed treaties of friendship with these territories and these treaties pave way for russian troops to move in these territory as peacekeepers now in this case russia is relying on the controversial theory called as theory of remedial cessation so what does this mean see so this theory is a doctrine which suggests that cessation may be the last resort for ending oppression what do you mean by cessation first it means the action of formally withdrawing from a political state this means they become independent of that political state in our case the political state is ukraine and the entities that are seeking the cessation according to russia are the donetsk and lugansk territories so this theory of remedial cessation says that the territories can become independent of a political state as a last resort to end oppression but how does this violate international law see we can clearly see that russia has effectively intervened and violated the sovereignty of ukraine in this matter how it has done this it has done this by recognizing the statehood of donetsk and lugansk but if you see actually ukraine itself agreed to recognize the autonomy of these two territories already this was uh, agreed by ukraine under the minsk accords or the minsk protocol that was signed with russia as part of the normandy format it was uh, a peace agreement signed in 2015 and under this one of the promise was to protect the right to self determination of these territories but still we can see that russia has intervened saying that ukraine is not taking any actions now coming to the point of how it violates international law see actually this one directly violates article 2 clause 4 of un charter as per this charter all members shall refrain from the threat of force or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state this means using force or any threat the territorial integrity of any state should not be terrorized so overall this clause upholds the principle of equal sovereignty of all nations so we can say that russia's action is a direct contravention of this principle and beyond all this just now we saw that russia is arguing the legitimacy of its invasion by upholding the principle of remedial cessation but according to the authors even this theory requires a very high threshold here the threshold may be severe violations of human rights or systemic oppression of ethnic russians by ukraine etc actually if you see russia is claiming that ukraine is undertaking genocide against ethnic russians but authors say that this accusation on ukraine has no evidence that is there is no evidence that ukraine is carrying out genocide against ethnic russians so saying that ukraine is doing genocide russia has invaded ukraine and this has threatened the territorial integrity and political independence of ukraine and that is why it violates article 2 clause 4 of un charter so due to this ukraine has taken the issue to the international court of justice so this was the first point now secondly as i just said russia has used force for example it has undertaken missile strikes on ukraine the missile was even targeted on non military objects then along with this russian forces are already marching through ukrainian soil so all this come under the definition of using of force in international relations but as usual russian president is claiming that he is acting in self defense as per article 51 of un charter so what is this article 51 see this article recognizes the inherent right of individual or collective self defense importantly this is in case of an armed attack by one state against another state but you have to remember two things here firstly the right to collective self defense under article 51 exists only for states but 
the territories of Donetsk and Lugansk are not states. That is, they are not countries under international law. They have been just now recognized as independent states by Russia, but not by any other international community. And secondly, as per Article 51, there should be armed attack by one state against the another to invoke this Article 51. But we know that Ukraine has not launched an armed attack against Russia. Or we can say it did not even attack the now independent territories of Donetsk and Lugansk. So authors are of the view that Russia's claim under the theory of anticipatory self-defense in the international law is inappropriate. So it cannot use this Article 51 to substantiate its actions. Now thirdly, we should also remember that these actions of Russian president are equal to committing the crime of aggression. See, the crime of aggression is defined under the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court. So, what this statute say? Under its Article 8, crime of aggression is defined as using force against the sovereignty, territorial integrity or political independence of another state. And just now we have proven that Russia has used force against the sovereignty of Ukraine. And it has threatened the political independence of Ukraine by recognizing the independence of Donetsk and Lugansk. So actually in an ideal case, according to International Criminal Court, the aggressor state and its leaders should face legal actions under the law for aggression. And they should take the responsibility. But the problem is actually ICC do not have jurisdiction. Why? Because here both the aggressor and the victim state, they are not part of Rome statute. Here the aggressor will be Russia and the victim state will be Ukraine. But these both are not party to ICC and that is why ICC do not have jurisdiction in this matter. Now fourthly, the issue is with respect to the invoking of the doctrine of humanitarian intervention by the Russian president. See this doctrine of humanitarian intervention is also termed as responsibility to protect that is R2P. What is this R2P? It means every state's responsibility to protect its population from gross violations of human rights. It also means that the international community should be responsibly assisting the states to fulfill this responsibility. Now this principle has been controversially used by the Russian president. He uses this to justify the use of force by Russia on Ukraine. Here, by this he justifies that Ukraine has failed in its duty to protect its own citizens. But remember that the actions taken as part of R2P may not be authorized by the United Nations Security Council. And that is why this R2P doctrine remains disputed in international law. But keeping this fact aside, if we even see whether Ukraine has failed to protect its citizens or not, According to the authors, there is no evidence that the ethnic Russians in Ukraine are facing atrocities. So, there is no background for using R2P, that is responsibility to protect. And that is why Russia's action is a violation of using this international humanitarian law. So, overall, we can say that Russia absolutely cannot justify its actions. And there is lack of an armed attack. And this is more pronounced in a scenario when there is a lack of an armed attack against Russia by Ukraine. So the authors of the article concludes by recollecting history during which uh, humanity has suffered a lot under the autocratic leaders. And a similar scenario is happening now also. Here the Russian leaders, especially its president, is believing that the world is divided into spheres of influence. And as per author's suggestion, such a belief should be destroyed by the efforts of global community. Why? Because the divide believed by Russia has two faces. On one side, it believes that the countries have true sovereignty. But on the other side, it also thinks that some countries possess nominal or limited sovereignty. And particularly in case of Ukraine, it sees Ukraine as an entity that possesses limited sovereignty. So these different spheres of influence should be destroyed by the efforts of global community is what is suggested by the authors. So for this, first the international law should be strengthened and it should be properly enforced to constrain and check arbitrary state power. So this is what is told by the authors. So overall in this discussion we saw that Russia has violated many international laws including the UN Charter. First of all, it has undertaken a full-scale invasion of Ukraine and it has uh, recognized the independence and sovereignty of Donetsk and Lugansk. And for this, Russia is upholding the theory of remedial cessation. 
but authors say that this violates article 2 clause 4 of un charter which states that the territorial integrity of any state should not be terrorized by using force and secondly russia has used force especially it has uh, undertaken missile strikes on ukraine by saying that it is acting in self defense as per article 51 of un charter but this uh, article 51 which provides uh, anticipatory self defense states that actions can be taken as part of collective self defense and more importantly this should be used only when there is an armed attack by one state against the another but we saw that both of these are absent in case of ukraine so russia's theory of anticipatory self defense is inappropriate in this case and then we also saw that the actions of russia are part of a crime of aggression under rome statute of international criminal court but we saw that icc does not have jurisdiction because russia and ukraine are not party to icc and finally we also saw that the doctrine invoked by russian president that is responsibility to protect is also not right because this doctrine in itself is disputed in international law plus there is no evidence that ethnic russians are being attacked in ukraine so all this shows that russia has violated many international laws so these are the points that you have to remember from this editorial discussion Now let's get to the next discussion. So the last discussion for today is going to be based on this front page article. It talks about a report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that is IPCC. As you know, IPCC is the United Nations body which is in charge of evaluating the science that is related to climate change. So in this manner, the report by IPCC is significant. and the report findings will be helpful for you in your main answer writing so pay attention here see this report is a summary report it is called the summary for policy makers which summarizes major conclusions from the working group to the ipcc's sixth assessment report that is ar6 this report actually highlights the connection of uh, climate ecosystems and biodiversity as well as human societies It also integrates the knowledge more strongly across the natural, ecological, social and economic sciences than the previous IPCC assessments. This can be seen in this image. Apart from this, the assessment of climate change impacts and the risks as well as adaptation are assessed in the context of concurrently developing non-climatic global trends. So let us see the findings of this report. See first of all according to the report despite adaptation efforts to reduce vulnerability the human induced climate change along with intense extreme events have caused widespread adverse impacts to nature and people this is true because the extent and magnitude of climate change impacts are larger than estimated in the previous assessments according to the report further the report also highlighted that climate change has caused significant deterioration of ecosystem structure and function It has also affected the resilience and natural adaptive ability. It has also caused shifts in seasonal timing and all these have negative socio-economic consequences. And thirdly, according to the report finding, approximately half of the species which are assessed globally, they have moved polewards or to a higher elevations on land. And even hundreds of species have been lost locally because of the magnitude of heat extremes. The heat extremes have not only increased on land but also in the ocean and forests. So this has made the species to move polewards. Actually some losses are already irreversible such as uh, the species extinctions which are driven by climate change. Now along with species extinctions which are irreversible other impacts are also becoming irreversible. This includes the hydrological changes caused by glacier retreat or changes in some mountain and arctic ecosystems caused by permafrost thaw etc all these are reaching irreversibility according to the report plus the study also notes that if governments follow their existing emission cutting targets then the global sea levels will likely increase 44 to 76 cm this century but this increase could also be reduced to 28 to 55 cm if emissions are reduced more quickly But the problem is there is increased emissions and the ice sheets are collapsing faster than projected. So this shows that the sea levels might rise by up to 2 meters this century and it will rise up to 5 meters by 2150. So these are the key findings of the IPCC report. 
and as a conclusion this report in particular raises three concerns first is that there is strong evidence that the escalating climate crisis is causing an increase in water related ailments and secondly the report also notes that climate change will have a significant influence on food production and food security and thirdly it also raises the concern of droughts and heat waves which will cause biodiversity loss as well as human migration so these are few points from the ipcc report you can just take note of these reports and whenever there is a question which asks you to list the impacts of climate change you can mention the points from this report so with these points in mind now let us get to the next session which is the practice questions discussion session so now let us take up this first question it is about the montreal convention first statement given is it regulates the transit and navigation in the black sea This statement might look correct but it is actually incorrect because Montreal Convention deals with the Turkish Straits including the Sea of Marmara. So it deals with Dardanelles Strait, Bosphorus Strait and Sea of Marmara and it aims to maintain the security and stability of Black Sea. But it does not regulate the transit and navigation in the Black Sea. So statement 1 is incorrect actually. Now the second statement states war vessels should be notified to Turkey through diplomatic channels prior to intended passages. This statement is correct. We saw that prior to the air passages in the Turkish Straits, the riparian states and the non-riparian states have to notify Turkey. The riparian states have to notify before 8 days and the non-riparian states before 15 days. So this statement is correct and here the question asks for the correct statements. Therefore the correct answer to this question is option B two only. Now this next question is a two statement question and it is about IPCC. Now the first statement is the objective of IPCC is to provide governments with scientific information that they can use to develop climate policies. Now this statement is actually correct. As you know IPCC was created in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization and the UNEP that is United Nations Environment Program and this is an organization of governments that are members of United Nations or WMO and currently IPCC has 195 members and its objective is to provide governments at all levels with the scientific information which they can use to develop climate policies and that is why statement 1 is correct now statement 2 through its assessments The IPCC identifies the strength of scientific agreement in different areas and conducts research wherever needed. Now here if you take the first half it is correct. Through its assessment it identifies the strength of scientific agreement in different areas and indicates where further research is needed. Now the second part mentions that conducts research wherever needed. See actually IPCC does not conduct its own research so in this manner the second half becomes incorrect and that is why this whole statement is incorrect and here the question also asks us to identify incorrect statements so the correct answer to this question is option B two only so with these two prelims questions i have this main question for you today this is a hot topic So try to answer this question and post the answer in the comment section whenever we will get time we'll review your answer with this we have come to the end of today's hindi news analysis and practice questions discussion session as usual if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and subscribe to shankar ai's academy youtube channel for receiving regular updates thank you